This sermon content comes from Mercy Village Church located in Barbersville, West Virginia. And you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. My mom, right, is a... If you've met her only once or twice, then you might not know this about her, but she's quick-witted, spunky, she's got a little bit of a tood, a little bit of sass. Two stories to exemplify that. And we, you know, Again, those of us that have good relationships with our mothers might have similar stories to these. I know I have more that are not able to be told in a church setting, right, between my mother-in-law uh, and uh, my wife's mama who's passed. There's a lot that are uh, not PG or even PG-13 that I could tell um, between uh, my my own wife. But there was this time, it was kind of a group setting. There was this guy that used to work with the ministry my parents work with, and, and he was a Marine. And the way you know someone's a Marine, they tell you, right? You You don't have to ask, they'll tell you. So there was someone else there from another military branch. I don't remember which one. And they, in between, like it might be at a meal or something. They, it was like a conference or whatever. They were going back and forth and, and uh, whatever. I don't know how it got to this, but his bold proclamation as part of this fight was like, uh, even right, like as a Marine, even without weapons, my body is a lethal weapon. That's what his big proclamation was. And my mom is just tired of it, I guess. So she goes, yeah, you're right. Your body's a lethal weapon. That's why you're always shooting off at the mouth. So just right there she goes. So a better one, not as politically correct anymore probably, but uh, the, there was a lady from the South. She found out my mom's a Yankee. My mom's from Maine. Uh, this lady's from the Deep South, and she was really proud of being from the South. And I, again, I don't know how they got there, but this woman ends up, pro- her proclamation is the South. You do know the South will rise again. That's her proclamation. And my mom says, you're right, the South will rise again. The, the scum always rises to the top. <laughs> so my mom said that, not me. Don't hold that, <laughs> don't hold that against me. Um, my mom obviously loves all people. That was just their way of being funny, right? It's funny. If you're from the South, don't be offended. And if you ever meet my mom, don't hold it against her. She's probably upset that I even told that story. Here's the reason I tell it, though. I think in our lives, many of us, even if it's not our own mom, because I know not all of us have maybe had great experiences with our own mom, but we've had ladies in our lives who have displayed strength, right? Like we laugh about some of these stories, but underneath them is this strength that certain women possess, this tenacity, um, this perseverance. We're going to meet five specific women in, in Exodus chapter 1 and 2 who were defiant, right, rebellious in the face of, of evil. They stood in the face of, of evil, unflinching. And we're going to learn from them today. Know this, though, it's not their story, it's, it's God's story. This is, this is God's story. And, but... With all of God's stories, as they play out in real time, they play out in real time uh, through people, His people. And today in this story, it's his, his defiant daughters. My prayer today as we look at these lives of these ladies is that, is that primarily we'll see God's divine power and providence, right? Regardless of whether you're a a mother or a woman to be inspired by these stories or not, that what you'll see above everything else is God's providence. God is, is over all things, working things together for the good of his people. And because of that, we can trust him, no matter how difficult situations get. And that also we'd be moved to obey him. Right? Like what we'll see over all through these ladies' lives today is that God's divine providence is... His, Sovereignty over all things testifies that he is worthy of obedience even when it's difficult. God is worthy of obedience even when it's difficult. So, Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
to see where these ladies are at, to, to meet them, you've got to understand the context. If you're familiar with the end of Genesis, what's happened is you've had Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. One of them's Joseph, right? Uh, before Dolly Parton had her coat of many colors, Joseph had a coat of many colors. His brothers hated him for it because he's most beloved by his father. They were going to kill him. Instead of killing him, they sell him into slavery in Egypt. Remember this one? He ends up in Egypt, and he's a turbulent story there. Sometimes he spends in prison. I mean, just, you know, as close to death as possible. But by the end, towards the end of Genesis, God has, in his providence, brought him to second in command of all of Egypt. There's a famine, far-stretching famine in the land of Egypt and beyond. God revealed to him this was coming, and he's prepared Egypt for it. And so they're ready. They're, they're ready for this famine, and those outside are not. And so they come to visit. And if you remember the scene of the story, Joseph and his, or Joseph's brothers show up, right? And they don't know it's him. After a few trips, to, or after their second trip to Egypt, he reveals that, he's, that it's Joseph. And in that, you see God's side. You remember he says, uh, Joseph says, what, they intend, what you intended for bad, God intended for good. He works it out. So Joseph's tight with the Pharaoh. His family moves down to a place called Goshen, and they start to multiply. The people of God, they grow. The Hebrew nation is growing there in Egypt. Can't be stopped. Can't be slowed. And while they're there, though, there's a transition in power, and we read about that in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, which I didn't put a slide for this. Don't worry. I'm sorry. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now, in Egypt history, Egyptian history, there were rulers who were not ethnic Egyptians. And then there were times where they were ruled by people who were ethnic Egyptians. Now, what scholars speculate is that when Joseph comes to power, we don't know this for sure, but people speculate when he came to power, there were outside rulers, right? Non-ethnic Egyptians ruling over Egypt as the pharaohs, right? And so as a non-ethnic Egyptian... Joseph is welcomed. It's not a big deal. But when ethnicity returns to power, Egyptian ethnicity returns to power in Egypt, it's speculated that when that transition happens, that's when the Hebrews, the Israelites, Joseph and his family are kind of cast aside. They actually become enslaved. That's what what, uh, the Pharaoh does. They're out making bricks. And it's terrible and hard and difficult. And the plan for the Pharaoh is population control. He's hoping that the men are out working all day. Even the women are out working all day. They'll not have time for reproduction. So that's not going to happen. They're going to be tired and exhausted. They're going to get sick more easily and die. It'll, it'll thin them out. But God has different plans. It doesn't happen. Instead, they grow in number. But then Pharaoh makes things worse. And this is where we, we start to meet some of these ladies. So it's already bad. The population uh, control idea of slavery isn't working. And, and in verse 15 of Exodus chapter 1, it says, The king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, said to the Hebrew midwives, these are our first two ladies, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. That's in your Bible. That's Game of Thrones. That's what, I mean, that's, right? Like, in Sunday school, the the flannel graph lesson, right, they don't show the emotional, extreme agony that was put on those Hebrew women when that was told to them. Understand this. Pharaoh, with his work, we, you, Americans were so spoiled, right? Like, we think we know what political hardship is. We don't. Pharaoh, with his mouth, could sentence them to death instantaneously. He was considered a god by the people who followed him. A god, right? He had absolute authority over their lives. Not only could he kill them, he also had the ability to make their lives beautiful, perfect, have everything that they need and want. He could bring them comfort and Right? So I want to just pass, read over that and be like, well, it's a no-brainer that, right, that they're not going to be a part of that plan. 
gender side. That's what that is. All the boys, kill them. By the way, so Pharaoh's afraid of the, the sons, not the daughters. I think that's super interesting because of the way this story is going to play out. But the reason is because the vast majority of fighting and dying in the history of the world is, has been done by men. Not all of it. There's incredible female warriors along the way, but, but the vast majority of, of fighting and dying has been done by men. And in that day, that would have been the, the fear. The more men they have, the more likely they are to rise up against, against uh, Egypt and overthrow. We don't want to give authority back to non-Egyptians ever again. Would have been the, that would have been the, the political mindset. So they put them under that. But nothing can stop God's sovereign plan. I think it's so funny. Pharaoh fears the sons of Israel. And God says, well, have you met my daughters? Right? You're scared of my sons. Have you met my daughters? And the first two we just met, Shephra and Pua. They have a hard decision to make. They really do. They probably got this edict. They're the, there's other midwives that serve under them. They're like in charge of all the midwives. There's other midwives serving under them, helping deliver the babies, uh, the Hebrew babies. They get this edict maybe from a messenger, maybe a piece of papyrus, who knows. It's probably not Pharaoh that delivers it to them directly. But they have a choice. Are we going to obey Pharaoh Or as we'll see in verse 17, are we going to obey God? But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. Their fear of God led them to defiant obedience to God. Hear me say this today because we're celebrating defiance in women. (laughs) The Bible is clear that all of us, male, female, slave, free, Jew, Gentile, our primary posture is one of submission to one another. We submit ourselves to God. We submit ourselves to one another. That's this Christian posture. It's very much unlike the way the world normally operates. We love others as we love ourselves. The first become last. The last become first. Our Savior washes feet and then dies. Right. Like that's this. The posture of Christianity is one of submission, but it is also unequivocally true of the Christian faith that when submission to authority requires us to walk out of step with what God calls his people to defiance is always the way. And that's the way that Pua and Shifra go. They understood that right and wrong is not a human invention. It's divinely ordered. They also understood this, that as long as they are with God, they're in the majority. No matter what the rest of society thinks or believes, whatever political authority thinks or believes, if they are with God, they are the majority. And so now Pharaoh confronts them face to face. Verse 18. So the king of Egypt called the midwives, you read it in between the lines, to himself, right? Can you imagine that Call, by the way, put yourself there. Again, this isn't a flannel graph story. Shefra and Pua have somebody come to their door, rap on it, right? Probably spear, armor, whatever, and say, Pharaoh wants to see you about this whole babies thing. Okay? Fear. Intimidation. But they go. And he says to them, so the king of Egypt called the midwife, said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? They don't know if they're going to live or die. Honestly, they don't in this moment. He could have killed them right there in his court. Know that. They've got a little story for him, though. I love this. Some people say they're lying. I I don't think they are. I'll explain that to you. The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like those weak Egyptian women... (laughs) For the Hebrew women are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. It's like a greased watermelon up in there, right? Like that thing, I mean, we can't get there in time. These babies, I mean, it's like that. We get the call, we get there, right? 
Because understand this, I forgot to mention this. The reason that he does it this way, Pharaoh does it this way, he gets those Hebrew women and, or those Hebrew midwives and says, I want you right, as soon as that baby comes out of the womb, I want you to, if it's male, kill it. As soon as you see the genitalia, if it's male, kill it. Right? Like right there, unseen, so that the rumor can spread that the gods of Egypt are better than the gods of the Hebrews. Right? Because this gender side is secret. It's not a public thing. It's happening behind closed doors. It's, it's happening in, in the bedrooms of these Egyptian women. And so he can point to his gods and say, see, our gods are better than the gods of the Hebrews. For some reason, all their male children are dying. So this is supposed to be a, a secret one. That's why it's done this way. And, and they say to him, when we get there, it can't be a secret anymore because these mamas are nursing these babies already. They're already born. Now, what I think it was what I think happened. These women are deeply committed to, the, to God, which means lying would not have been their first choice. But I think they've found a way to develop plausible deniability. I really do. I think that word is spread among the Hebrew community. Hey, get you a stick to bite down on when labor starts. Right? Don't call the midwives till it's absolutely necessary. Right? Because there's a conflict of interest here. And that, that's spread, right? And so now that's their way, right? As a community of people. Maybe they're just lying to Pharaoh's face. That's possible too. But either way, they are defiant in the face of leadership, the leadership of, of Pharaoh. Look how God deals with them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. There's two little nuggets there too, right? So uh, the midwives are blessed in two ways. And I think it's important for the people of God. The first is that the community around them is blessed. Sometimes we don't like those blessings because those blessings make us bitter, right? The first blessing that comes to them is that the rest of Egypt or the rest of the Hebrews around them multiply. They don't have kids yet. Likely... And that day, if you were a midwife, you were either barren or you were single. So you're either barren because you haven't been married, or you're married but still barren because you can't conceive to have babies. And so they watch all these babies be born constantly. But that's the blessing God gave them. Sometimes the blessing God will give you is for the person sitting down the row from you. And that's not always easy to recognize as a good gift from God, but it is. In this case, he also opens their wombs, either by bringing them husbands or, or if they're already married, he opens their wombs for them to have children. He blesses them. So in the midst of oppression and evil and all of these things, these women stand out. They're highlighted for their defiance. Verse 22, then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. He takes it from a private, hidden gender side to a public gender side. All the Egyptian nationalists are now set free to do whatever they want to the Hebrew boys, right? You, you could see it in the market, right? Babies being ripped out of their, right? Cast into the, to the Nile. That's now the situation. And into that situation, these women have all, not just stood on their own, but they've inspired others to stand in defiance. The next woman we meet is Jochebed in Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. She's not named. None of the rest of the women are named here. We learn their names later in the book of Exodus. We only know who they are from, from later. But here, the only women named are uh, Shephra and Pua. Moses loved these women. If he's the author of Exodus, I can imagine him smiling as he writes their names. They inspired what would be the saving of his life. In chapter 2, we meet his mother. Now, a man from the house of Levi, his name is Amram, went and took as his wife a Levite woman. Her name's Jochebed. The woman conceived and bore a son. Again, right? <clears throat> she conceives the, and bears a son in secret. And as soon, there's no ultrasound, as soon as she sees the genitalia, her heart, not because it's a boy, but because of the current situation, just imagine her heart dropping. This is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. 
She conceives and bears a son. And when she saw, how many times can a pastor say genitalia in a sermon? That's, that's what I'm going to try. That's what I'm going for today. When she saw that he was a fine child, that's what my mom said, she, she hid him for three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she uh, took for him a basket. That's the part of the story we remember uh, most made of bulrushes and daubed with bitum and pitch and put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. That's the famous part of this story. We still have Moses baskets. To this, you can buy a Moses basket to this day. Like it's still like a thing. So Jochebed has a choice. Her name means Yahweh is glory, by the way. Which is another clue to where her allegiance lies. She's more, she fears the Lord more than she fears Pharaoh. And so it's easy to say that she just did what any mother would do. But if you've lived long enough, you know that she didn't do what any mother would do. She did what in particular a mother who understands the image of God that we bear the image of God would do. She chooses risk over safety. She chooses difficulty over comfort. She chooses life over death. This will not be the easy choice for her. Know that. The easy choice for her would to be without her son. To see that baby gone. She chooses the difficult path. Listen to me, today it still takes courage to be a mama. It really does. It takes emotional vulnerability to be a mother. It takes fortitude to be a mother. It takes discomfort, a measure of discomfort. Some seasons greater than others, but a measure of discomfort to be a mother. She chooses that. For Jochebed, being a mama took explicit defiance to earthly authorities and powers of her day. Defiance to the dominant culture of where she lived. But the story gets even more interesting because after we meet Jochebed, right up till now, it's been Hebrew women. We understand their motivation. Yahweh is who they fear. God is their glory. That's who they're, now we meet an Egyptian woman who's going to join the story. And it's even crazier than that because it's not just an Egyptian woman. Verse 5, now the daughter of the gender side king. The daughter of the one who wrote the edict that all the babies that are male and Hebrew should be thrown into the Nile. That Pharaoh. Hitler's Right? That's who came down to bathe at the river while her young woman women walked beside the river. She saw the basket. The gender side king's daughter sees the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. Verse 6, when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, again, God's providence. Babies don't always cry. I don't know if you've ever had one, but it's crying now. I like to think that that God reached down and pinched that baby, because the only thing harder to resist than a baby is a baby with big old dinosaur tears pouring out of its eyes, and the baby was crying, and she took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. God's flipping the script. In his divine providence, he's flipping the script. This woman who's likely not a a biological mother, inside of her has all the instincts of a mother. And right now, whether the whether Jochebed had planned this, like she knew this is where Pharaoh's daughter bathes or not, I don't know. Is this just a complete surprise? More likely it's just a complete surprise. But either way, God was not surprised. She has compassion for that child. How unlikely is that? How 
you wouldn't have written the story that way. You wouldn't have. I would not have written the story that way. But God writes the story that way. Listen, there's this proverb from Togo, West Africa. I love it. It says, God chases the flies from the animal without a tail. What that means is Jochebed and her daughter and her husband, Pharaoh had cut off their tail. All the pestilence that he was bringing upon them, they had no way, right? You've seen a cow, or not a cow, or a horse, like flip their tail, whatever, to bat off the flies? That's a tail. They can't do that. They can't push back against the pestilence. God chases the flies away with the daughter of the one who sent the flies to begin with. Come on. This is our God. You think that your situation right now can't be turned around to bring glory to God and joy to your heart? Think again, because this book's full of stories like that. This is one of them. Here comes Pharaoh's daughter. God's using the daughter of the one who decreed genocide to rescue the boy, the glorious mystery of God's providence. Last one of our five defiant daughters. And she's young. Listen, if this girl would have been 13 years old or older, <clears throat> this is wild. You got to know this. It makes the story so much more beautiful. She would have been off making bricks. So she couldn't have been 13 or older. If she was under six years old, she probably wouldn't have been trusted with this task. So she is between six and 12 years old, most likely. Again, that's, we don't know that for sure, but that's what the evidence would suggest. It's like a 10 year old girl. She's like my daughter's age. Standing there, guarding her baby brother in the reeds. And here comes the daughter of the one who's killing all the babies. Can you imagine how much her heart's racing? Man, she's stone cold. Watch her. Verse 7. Then his sister, she comes running up. She says to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse? She sees the, get, wait for that too, right? Like she's probably waiting to see the, her face, the Pharaoh's daughter's face. Because if it's one of anger, one of frustration, one of go get the guards, we got to take care of this. It's a different story. But instead she saw a look in the princess's face that reminded her of the way her mom had looked at her. That reminded her of the way her mom had looked at at baby Moses when he'd been born. So she runs up. Sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went (laughs) and called the child's mother. Come on. We haven't even got to Moses yet. Five defiant daughters, right? The story has been completely played out by God's sovereign hand, providential good through these women. And now it's through a young 10-year-old, 11-year-old little girl thinking on her feet, doing what's right, coming up there. Remember, This highlights five defiant daughters, but this story really highlights one providential God. Watch how it plays out, verse 9 and first half of verse 10. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away to Jochebed, the wet nurse. She's a wet nurse now. (laughs) Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. She's going to get paid to raise her own son. (laughs) Where do we sign up for that, right? So the woman took the child and nursed him. His mother took the child and nursed him. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. I bet that was a very, very difficult day. But those two to three years, most likely, that she weans that baby, she gets to invest in him the doctrines of the Hebrew God, Yahweh. She gets to sing to him the songs of her people. She gets to share the stories of Yahweh with her son. And then, and God's designing uh, this boy this way on purpose, he's then adopted into the royal family where he'll learn uh, 
Egyptian culture, Egyptian politics, God's preparing him for something very, very special. But imagine Jochebed at the market with her little baby, and her friends come up to her holding her one-and-a-half-year-old child, and they say, that's a beautiful girl, Jochebed. What's her name? You know why they say that? Because you wouldn't go to market with a baby boy. Because the death squad will take your baby boy and throw it in the Nile River. So if you see a baby, a Hebrew baby out in public, it's a girl. She says, no, it ain't a girl. This is my son. Well, here, hide him, quick. Put this blanket. No. He's royalty. Your story is no different. Helpless in the Nile. Me too, right? Our little baby arms, trying to make ourselves right with God with our little baby arms in our little Moses basket. A child of royal blood, Jesus comes and plucks us out. Saves us. Brings us into his family, right? Our story is the the exact same. Look who the boy is. You already know this. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. God's doing something. The boy's back with his mama. He's adopted into royalty and observed the rescue. The sons were the ones to fear, but the daughters were the ones who rescued Moses. The water that was designed to kill him will be the water where his life is saved. The family of wrath that was supposed to bring wrath down upon him will be the family that rescues him. God flips the script. And so for the children of God today, what's the application? These defiant women speak to all of us, male and female, and tell us that even when times are difficult, because God is sovereign and providential and good and works things out for his glory and the good of his people, we can trust him. We can obey him even when things are difficult. That's for all of us today. Every single one of us can learn from these five defiant daughters that obedience to God is worth it even when it's difficult. But let me close by talking to the daughters of God in this room. In particular, those who are in seasons or maybe seemingly always in seasons where you have found yourself in what society would call stereotypical womanly roles. Raising kids, those types of things. Or in a career that is normally kind of, that's what women do. They're the mother baby nurses. They're the, you know what I'm saying. In particular, those of you who find yourself in stereotypical womanly roles. Look at the passage again more closely. We have two non-mothers that we meet in Shifra and Pua who are caring for other people's children as if they are their own, even though they don't go home to the same house as those kids. Right? Like there's people who live like mothers, as mother baby nurses, as elementary school, middle school, high school teachers, as psychiatrist as mentors to other right they live that way before they even have children some of you have children and still serve in those roles investing in the lives of children every stinking day some of those thankless jobs we've got a biological mother in the story moses shares jacobed's dna it is her biological Son, We've got an adoptive mother in the princess. She doesn't share DNA with, with, uh, with Moses, but she becomes his mother. We've got a bio mom who becomes a foster mom, technically, right? Jochebed is going to serve as a foster mom for three years and then give the baby to. And we've got a sister. The point is, those like very stereotypical womanly roles are used by God for the good of his kingdom. They're not the only way the kingdom advances. I think that's probably pretty obvious. But they are a very particular way 
in a good way, in a way worth celebrating, that the kingdom of God ascended. So take your challenge from Moses' name. She drew him out of the water. Women, in your stereotypically womanly roles, whether it be teacher, mother, nurse, whatever, keep drawing the babies out of the water. Keep investing yourself. When they wear you down to the bone, right? 9 p.m. was bedtime an hour ago. Keep pulling them out. Diaper number 72 of the week. Keep pulling them out. Thankless student in your classroom or thankless parent in your classroom. Number after COVID, probably 657, right? Keep pulling them out. What you're doing is worthy. The work of your hands is not in vain, invest. See, God ain't just bringing Moses into the world. Moses is going to point us to somebody else. Moses is going to point us to Jesus. Moses, a boy in Egypt, saved from the genocide of a king. Jesus, a boy in Nazareth. Remember, he was almost the victim of a genocide too. And where did he go? Egypt. Both those boys went through Egypt, avoiding genocide by God's grace. Moses would become a royal son through adoption and gain the benefits of royalty. Jesus would give up the benefits of royalty, come to this earth, live as a man, die in our place so that we could gain the benefits of royalty. Moses would go into the river of death for his own salvation. And come out alive on the other side. Jesus would climb the hill of death. and Carry with him all of our sins on his back. He would die. He would be buried in the tomb of death. But three days later he would come out on the other side alive. Moses. He would owe his life to, to the women in his life. That God graciously and providentially put in, in that place. Jesus owes nothing to anyone. But yet, in his gracious and mysterious providence, he would send women first from the grave to proclaim the risen Jesus. Moses would one day, by God's grace, lead the people of God to freedom from slavery and almost all the way to the promised land. Jesus says to you today, be free. Through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, be free. Last verse, Acts, sermon on the Old Testament. Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believed is free from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Jesus is the better Moses. Jesus is has performed for us what we could not perform for ourselves, making us able to be right with God. And because of that, God's divine providence, working through every person in this room who is a child of God, regardless of age or gender or background, God's divine providence testifies that he is worthy of obedience even when it's difficult. So what's difficult right now? Where are you struggling to walk in obedience? It's worth it. He's worthy of following. These five defiant daughters prove that. And countless other stories prove the same. Might we be obedient to God. Father, thank you so much for loving us enough to give your son Jesus to die. Thank you for raising him from the dead. Thank you for the work that you did through these five women and, and countless others that aren't even mentioned in the passage to bring Moses to the forefront of leading the Hebrews out of Egypt and pointing us to Passover and Passover pointing us to your son, Jesus, and Jesus offering to us today freedom. If anyone's here today not a Christian, I pray that they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved today. For those of us who are your children, give us, like the five defiant daughters we saw today, a boldness to obey even when it's difficult. In the name of Jesus.
Jesus we pray. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to this feed wherever you listen to podcasts. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. And we'd love for you to experience what God is doing as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. Connect with us online at www.mercyvillage.church.